Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey, and I'm, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dave Shook, who uh, now of Uptake. Uh, Dave, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Now, we last time we spoke was, uh, oh gosh, a year ago, of course, and much has changed. It was even pre-pandemic, if you can believe. And uh, uh, but, but the theme that I wanted to talk through today was um, the, the the past year, really, since the you know the, the calendar has, has advanced uh, for us, and uh, to talk through um, what's been the impact on the world of uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, driven by the uh, changing uh, economic landscape, uh, we've we've um, on the one side, you know, the the economies have slowed down considerably, but on the other hand, the pressures from ESG, from uh, uh, the new new drives to growth, to coping with the pandemic and making things more resilient, uh, suggest that uh, there's been considerable advancement and change. And I think you're at the just at the pinnacle of being able to articulate that. So. That's the goal of today. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, happy to talk about that. It's been a very interesting year. Has been, yes, indeed. Now, just uh, just to begin, though, I wonder if you could, um, you know, just in a very, very, very brief way, uh, t- tell us a little bit, uh, remind the audience a little bit about who you are and, and what you're up to these days. Sure. So, Shukaoki is a company that was created to help operating companies get the data from their uh, operational systems, get it up to Microsoft Azure Cloud, uh, organize it there and make it available for them to get value from it with visualization, uh, business intelligence, machine learning types of applications. Uh, and we have spent the last three, four years building up our capacity as a company to deliver that in a shrink wrapped, reliable, repeatable way. Um, last August, we brought on board uh, Vice President of Operational Applications to help move us up from that sort of data acquisition and organization story to more value-added applications. Um, and then just earlier this month, we were acquired by Uptake, a, um, a company that uh, has very complementary offerings to us and allows us to both allows both companies to accelerate uh, our motion towards solving industrial problems. That's fantastic. Where are they based, uh, Dave? Are they American, Canadian, or yeah, European? They're American. They're based in Chicago. Oh. Uh, but you know, as with everybody these days, everyone's working from home. <laughs> Yeah, it kind of doesn't matter where you are uh, based anymore. The world's the world's gotten a lot smaller, as it turns out. Yeah, time zones matter, mm. but uh, actual physical location not so much. Not so much now. Uh, so since we've last spoke, though, the world ha- of Internet of Things has, as I suspect, been changing and continues to change. Any sector that's on Moore's law uh, of, comp- of um, uh, rapid and exponential change is going to be uh, very different, even to within the space of a year. I wonder if you could just provide a, a comment on how the world of IoT has advanced and changed in the in the past twelve months. Sure. So first of all, we have seen. Uh, enormous growth and maturity uh, in the area of the connected world. Uh, so the pandemic in particular accelerated a great deal of work that had been moving along relatively slowly for workers, you know, working on their own and yet being effective. So the whole uh, issue of providing information to people in the field, uh, allowing them to collaborate with people remotely, uh, that bringing the IoT data or bringing the information back down to the human being in the field, uh, as well as uh, sensing the person's 
uh, health and health status, those have both come on with a rush mm. in the last year. Uh, other remote sensing applications have picked up as well. So uh, everything from the usual sort of vibration monitoring stuff uh, upwards has uh, been gathering a lot of speed. So I, I get the connected worker side and visibility to the workforce for health reasons. And um, uh, but my hypothesis would be that uh, to achieve things like social distancing measures and uh, and reduce the need for workers to travel very much, because traveling is one of the drivers of the pandemic, as we you know, infected individuals seed the communities in which they visit with with the virus, uh, that there would be a drive to adopt uh, those uh, sensor technologies in, in place to reduce the need for. Um, the traveling Woolberries are going out to visit assets, so improving visibility. Oh, and is, that, is that also happening here? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the uh, there up really until last year, there was a, a reasonable amount of amount of motion towards remote sensing yeah. in the oil patch around you know, uh, well status, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and that has you know, moved on apace. Uh, it was previously driven by the need to reduce, uh, well, desire to reduce windshield time. Yeah. The amount of non-productive time that the operators spend driving around. Yep. Uh, so the, that has you know, become increasingly accelerated. The whole idea also of bringing data to people because, you know, business travel uh, I have, uh, you know, I haven't gotten on a plane since the <laughs> first lockdown last year, and I imagine most other people haven't. So mm. in the past, we would actually you know, go out to sites and we would look at things. So the, the uh, making that data from remote sensing available through organizations to third parties is... Uh, picking up a lot of speed as well. Uh, yeah. And you know, we can get into the sort of governance and cybersecurity impacts of that in, in a few minutes. But yeah, yeah absolutely. I, as you would expect, um, remote worker, it, making it so that workers are as efficient as possible, reducing uh, both local travel and long distance travel. Um, now, some of the, some of the, Se sectors within the oil and gas industry have really taken it on the chin, right? Drilling, you know, yeah. notably, yeah. Uh, has has taken it on the chin. Mm -hmm. And although we are seeing them, you know, the drilling companies are, you know, while they're not exactly spending a whole lot of money, they are doing retooling to be uh, more effective in their utilization of data uh, to drive down operations. Costs oh, that's uh, cool. and to improve the value they're offering. So yeah. they're even even the people who got hit the hardest are are looking hard at investing in you know modern technology to to improve their value delivery. Well, and that's in two degree not as surprising as you would think because their capital does turn over quite uh, regularly. Uh, you know, a drill rig is just one example. It doesn't run forever. Mm. <laughs> it gets so beat up on the you know the field that, and the technology itself, the physical technology advances. So adding a, a better uh, digital technology uh, to that capital turnover um, is easier, I would think. But let's uh, let's uh, just kind of taking that one step further. Uh, does this expansion that that you've seen uh, now on uh, create new and emerging issues that companies are going to have to deal with? You know, if you think. About but a connect a much more connected workforce. Does this drive uh, uh, different uh, different issues, uh, say related to connectivity, that, that suddenly now become paramount? Right. Okay. So one obvious one is just the ability for connected workers to connect when they're at remote well sites. A lot of these well sites do not necessarily have great cellular covers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so that just sort of basic connectivity out there is sometimes a, a significant issue. Uh, another one uh, gets into worker privacy quite quickly. The If the company is aware of where the worker is um, to uh, and workers 
tend to be carrying company equipment with them at all times, there's a question of how much of the worker's life outside work is the employer, uh, does the employer have a right to be privy to? Yeah. So that's not a technological issue. That's uh, an organizational and legal issue around uh, the boundary between work and home. Yeah. Yeah. More, gov more governance than technical, actually, but but still Absolutely. related. Yeah, there may be there's certainly an ethical uh, uh, issue lurking there too, right? It's uh, um, and and sensor technology does open up. Although people don't think about it, it, does open up ethical questions even in the world of industrial IoT. Absolutely. Hmm. So, those are sort of two obvious ones off the top of my head. Yeah. <clears throat> there's there on the technical side. And this is sort of our meat and potatoes in Shook IoT, is with the the data coming in from multiple systems now, where you've got you've got data coming in from your control system and data coming in from you know, maintenance systems and production systems, uh, being able to make that data you know consolidated into a form that it is digestible by the poor person of the sharp end who wants to know about this particular pump or you know, well or you know, motor, uh, that organization of that data is non-trivial. And it's really important because otherwise you end up with someone at the sharp end, instead of them having a, useful, a usable app, uh, they have the equivalent of 17 browser windows open on a phone, right? <laughs> and that just does not work. Right? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of work going on right now around how best to organize and present uh, that type of information to the the people at the sharp end. Yeah. So there's there's both I would say hardcore technical. Uh, things around the bandwidth and plumbing, and then there's these sort of computer science-y things about you know, how do we organize data from multiple sources, both from an um, information modeling point of view and from a just how we show it in one screen. Uh, it's interesting you raise that because I, I actually have been on the receiving end of more than one, now that I think about it, uh, contact in industry talking to me about their improved dashboard technologies for solving this uh, data integration, data, data consumption problem. And uh, I think you've just revealed like why it's suddenly an issue. Uh, it's because you're, you're out on your phone. We've done everything we can now to equip the field worker on the phone to be effective. Uh, but the uh, organization of the data that they need uh, is still is still lacking. You know, one thing we didn't uh, did, haven't touched on. Well, you hinted at it earlier on was uh, cyber and cyber risks. To what degree mm -hmm. are cyber considerations um, now either either elevated in importance or are they or is it still the same? Um, or or have we advanced our state of use of cyber uh, resilience to a point now where cyber questions are no longer uh, uh, topical? I would say, unfortunately. We're still in a place where the industrial or the cybersecurity people within the industrial companies still have a lot to learn about security of IoT devices and security in and to and from the cloud. Mm. So uh, the first thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, tales of insecure IoT devices are legion, right? There's many horror stories of terribly insecure IoT devices. Yeah. However, in the industrial world, you don't have that because the industrial IoT device providers understand that security is the first priority and they understand that the first question they're going to be asked is about security and there are both hardware and software platform approaches to securing the IoT devices. So the first thing I would say is that the IoT devices by and large are more secure than people 
in industry tend to think they are. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's, a, yeah. it's, it's the, the the media tends to play this up though because anytime we have an industrial uh, cyber event, it tends to be front page news, which highlights probably why it's a reasonably rare event that is front page news. Uh, but it does yeah. make does make people think, oh, well, the, this is an insecure environment. Look at this terrible thing that's happened. But uh, uh, it might not be the case. Actually, it's just a rare event. In fairness to um, industrial cybersecurity practices tend not to be as good as uh, head office cybersecurity practices. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a combination of a difference in priorities and uh, different in level of skill. And the way I always describe it is in the operational domain, the most important thing is to keep the plant running. Yeah. Uh, and so within, when you have a fence line, uh, you tend to use that fence line as a physical barrier and a physical source of security. And within the control environment, within the automation environment, access to data is more important than uh, preventing people from accessing data they shouldn't have access to. Yeah. Uh, so availability trumps confidentiality. Mm. In, in the business environment, it's the other way around. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so you have these two quite flipped sets of priorities. The, the other problem is that we can no longer trust the fence line. <laughs> so the, the people with this, the plant must be kept running at all times point of view are frankly, in many cases, working in an older paradigm. Secondly, they tend not to come from a IT cybersecurity background. They tend to come from a technical background in instrumentation or like yeah. engineering or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So they tend not to have the hardcore IT cybersecurity point of view and skill set that the people on the business side have. So it, it is fair to think that industrial control systems are actually not that secure. Uh, and most operating companies do work hard to secure them, but there are technological and uh, organizational cultural barriers. Yeah. So, but the IoT data, uh, funnily enough, is actually more secure because it tends to be, uh, for a start, data acquisition only. So there's no commands going back down over I over the IoT yep. connection. One way flow. So yep. It's a one way flow of data. Mm -hmm. Uh, secondly, they're designed to transmit over the open internet in the first place, not in a safe environment. Hmm. So the, there's already all sorts of proper authentication and encryption set up at the, at the starting point. Again, this is a differentiator from the sort of commercial or home IoT, where you know I have no idea if the camera in my garage is sending encrypted or unencrypted data, but I know that the, that the industrial cameras are sending encrypted data to an authenticated end. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to uh, let's turn to this ESG question, um, though, because um, uh, the, as a re related to the uh, the the pro probably a demand driver uh, uh, is this this um, now shift in the administration south of the border, which which um, you know we go, we go roll back a year. Um, when the previous administration uh, was much less switched on to uh, ESG concerns, certainly not to the same degree as uh, as in Europe. Now that's changed. Uh, the Americans right. have rejoined uh, the Paris Climate Accord uh, and uh, and are now being very clear uh, of their interests in in uh, supporting uh, uh, the uh, climate moves around the planet. Uh, in response, we've we've seen General Motors as one example. Almost within hours of the new new president being elected, abandoning their opposition to uh, EPA regulation and role, uh, uh, rules, and 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 now siding with the California rules. That was a I mean, to my was a very clear indicator that uh, the U.S. In industry is shifting gears. Uh, so so uh, how can I mean what's what what do you see as the role now? Uh, of uh, the world of IoT in helping to um, address uh, these these uh, these emerging and, and um, looming ESG worries. So let's talk about the the monitoring piece first. Yeah. Right? So the, the the simplest use case here is it is now significantly less expensive to implement effective 
and pretty thorough environmental monitoring around point sources. Hmm. So uh, you don't necessarily have uh, the same sort of reliability necessarily as you would have uh, from a uh, full you know, control system, but you ha can get you know, easily over 99% uptime from a you know, battery powered uh, sensor looking at uh, air quality, you know, temperature, even something as simple as temperature, pressure, humidity. Um, you can get an H2S monitor, um, like the, the H2S monitoring sensor mm -hmm. is about 30 bucks. Wow. So, yeah. So hmm. uh, think about what that does to being able to put, you know, monitoring at wellhead. Yeah. Those would have at one point, those would have been thousands of dollars, I would have yeah. thought. And now, yeah. you know, shrunk down onto the chipset, they're 30 bucks. Right. Like, exactly. And, mm. and, and of course, everybody in industry, their first response is going to be, oh, are you going to trust your life to a $30 sensor? And it's like, well, like, first of all, you have to understand that the sensor inside the $2,000 instrument is probably about 30 bucks as well. <laughs> That's true, actually. Right. That's true. Secondly, yeah. you get a lot more diagnostic information in an IoT communication package than you get in a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you could also so, add you could also add redundant sensors too. If the concern is is that oh the, you're going to get false positives or you know your thirty dollars sensor is rubbish, well put three on. You're still exactly. like a hundred dollars. Exactly. Lots of redundant backup for your sport. Yeah, precisely mm. right. So so it kind of shift. So first of all, monitoring becomes much less expensive. Yeah. Um, uh, on the uh, on the governance side. There's some really interesting implications around data governance involving blockchain. Mm. Right? So the idea that you can use blockchain to stamp and verify a number that came in from a sensor mm. and, and it, to show that it, it has not been edited or in what way it has been edited before you report to an external governing body makes it a makes it really interesting conversation now about you know these the the field sensors the the reliability of the information and the decision making processes based upon this trustworthy data now huh. right. hmm. so there's there's some to me blockchain is an and I am not a um blockchain evangelist, but I do see that in the governance world, there is a role for blockchain in providing uh, information about the genealogy of the data that is reported. Yeah, improving its trust level and, and, and yeah, solving for this uh, this worry that it's been, you know, the data has been massaged or manipulated in, in some fashion. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so that's a really very much an early developmental thing. So we're mm. going to see more growth in that space. Yeah. Um, the, the it, so that's, you know, those are sort of two top mm -hmm. of mind items. Mm. Um, so environment, social, so environment it, with the other aspects of environment, we are seeing big energy companies changing the way they think from being oil and gas companies to being energy companies. Yep. So we're seeing you know, companies, you know, for instance, Suncor bought uh, about a year and a half ago, they bought a uh, small chemical company in Edmonton that is taking uh, waste city uh, garbage, bio, uh, biomass, biomass, and they're turning it into ethanol, right? Oh, right. So Enercam mm. Alberta, right? Mm. So you're getting these large companies that have for decades been, you know, focused on get the hydrocarbons out of the ground, refine them, sell them to hang on. We are now energy companies. Yeah. And, and a lot of that, you know, is, is driven by, you know, let's face it, the climate is changing. Carbon dioxide is a bad thing to put into the atmosphere. Uh, these companies have got pretty, uh, thick stacks of money to work with right now. They would like to keep it that way. And so they're looking at participating in 
the next generation of the sort of energy consumption and production system. Yeah. Uh, and so new technologies there are, you know, highly IoT dependent when you look at everything from wind turbines to intelligent solar cells. Uh, that's all IoT stuff. Yeah, lots and lots of sensors. I worked with a, a, a Japanese um, <clears throat> parts company many, many, many years ago. And um, the, the, the biz, business case at the time was componentry in, in um, um, phones. We, we were shifting from, you may, you may remember, <laughs> you're my age or maybe a little younger, rotary phones. Well, we went from rotary to push button phones and the demand on electronics inside that, that phone went way up. But even back then, they were staring at the automotive industry Industry. And they said, you know, the, the a number of sensors going into a car, um, these industrial uh, assets is going to skyrocket. And we need to stop thinking about, you know, simple chipsets in phones and start thinking about how do we how do we uh, gear up for that world? And that would have been in the, back in the 90s, if you can believe. So it's 25 years ago. Yeah, take, no, I believe it. Takes a long time for it to roll its way through. We, I, one thing I was curious about was uh, you know, if you could highlight any stories or case studies. And you don't have to name names, but um, you know what you've seen is really good practice for those organizations seeking to adopt these more sophisticated IoT sensors. How would you, if you had to kind of sketch out the best practice toolkit that you would advise someone to apply? What, what would it be included in it? Um. So this is a, a question with a very long answer. So I will try and <laughs> go against habit and, and give you a couple of relatively short ones. Um, so the important thing to bear in mind in any digital transformation is, and, and this is especially true in cases where the technology landscape is in flux. Mm -hmm. So you don't really know what the endpoint is. Right. Right. So what that means is that the people who are most affected by the work, um, the operators, the data entry people, the people in procurement, the, the people whose jobs are going to be profoundly affected they're going to go through a series of steps, not a single step. Uh -huh. And not every step is going to be positive in its implications on them. Whether you're talking about headcount or the fact that a new technology has got you know, flaws in it when initially implemented, there's going to be some backward steps along the way or some steps that feel backwards. Yeah, way. very true. So, yeah, it's a journey. So, or it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. And it is extraordinarily important that you have line management carrying business accountability who understand that and who understand that their function during a time of change is to support the employees in their journey through that change. Yeah. Right? And that's the biggest differentiator between success and failure. Yeah, you know, it's a question, you know, of who's got your back. And I had, I had someone characterize it for me like this, you know, if I'm supporting a new technology and I'm a frontline worker and something goes sideways, because it's, you know, as you point out, might have some flaws in it. Who, who's going to be sanctioned at the end of the year on a performance review? Or who's going to get yelled at uh, because it didn't work? And and if the employee, frontline employees don't feel that management has their back, we're not going to support them, then their Absolutely. motivation to do this is going to be very, very low. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So it's you, at a time like this, uh, servant leadership is really yeah. important. Yeah, very true. Right. So uh, first of all, the, the companies that have got uh, not just support, but enthusiastic ownership by line management of the results of the transformation mm. and who understand their role in sustaining the, the success, they do well. Mm. All right. Very good. Um, so that probably more than anything. Uh, there are a, a couple other things. So we have found uh, that you know, quite honestly, the multi-cloud approach is really expensive compared to going through a single cloud vendor. We, yeah. we at Shokai OT 
predicated the company upon Microsoft Azure. And I'm, I, this isn't to flog Microsoft Azure. This is just we made an obs- We made a strategic choice. We said, look, industrial companies, they have other fish to fry than uh, when it comes to, you know, architecting an end-to-end solution. They want to buy something that does something. Yeah. Right. Very pragmatic. And, yeah. It, right. It got other fish to fry. Right. And uh, we knew that every industrial company would have some footprint in the Microsoft commercial cloud because Microsoft Windows and Microsoft 365 get you there really quickly. And then it's, you know, there's a, it makes a lot of sense to move a bunch of the standard sort of business applications up to Azure. And before you know it, all the organizational infrastructure to support deploying that cloud is already in place. Already in place, yeah. So wh- where where we have encountered companies that have struggled is companies that want to roll their own. Hmm. Right? So we've had a number of conversations with people where it's like, uh, you know, we have this solution on the shelf, and they go, "Oh, that's not very special. I can do that myself." And then six months later, they come crawling back to us and they go, um, can you help me yeah. install that for us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So companies have to understand what they are going to focus on doing uniquely well and what is commodity to them. Yeah. And, right. and, and uh, yeah, getting that sort of what I call them the signature um, ways of doing business and figuring out what's truly differentiating and what's not. That's um, right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. It's a really so, good point. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. The, the, I just wanted to wrap up though on on the 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 other the exciting news uh, that uh, took place last month, where you were acquired. Um, yes. And very interested to learn about the motivation of the deal. I'm assuming being part of a larger family of companies opens up opportunities for you. So maybe you could oh, just uh, share a little bit about the about the deal. Yeah, sure. There's kind of a left brain and right brain approach here. So in the cold light of day. Uh, at Shokai OT, we were growing and we were paying our bills. Right? Uh, but we know that there's a finite window of opportunity right now while a bunch of systems are in flux for us to uh, grab market share, for oh. us to grow really quickly and become the dominant player in a particular space. Yeah. And the, uh, the, Organically generated cash flow wasn't going to allow us to accelerate to the way that we needed. So we knew we we knew that we needed access to some investment, uh, especially on the sales sales front. Yeah, we were doing really well, like in generating awareness of ourselves. We had a really good relationship with Microsoft, who's been a superb supporter of us. But we knew that we couldn't scale our sales organization at the rate we needed to in order for us to. Uh, you know, become dominant. In the yeah, market. capture this window of opportunity in front of us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we knew, we were open to external investment, mm. uh, but and we we had a few conversations with other companies along the way, but either they undervalued us from our point of view, yep. or it was not a really good strategic fit. So then the other half of the brain comes in, and Shook IoT, although we were building this infrastructure stuff, our Heart, hearts and souls really are around delivering value through analytics. Mm. Right. Mm. And uh, Uptake already has a whole bunch of analytics in exactly the area we were planning to go to. <laughs> so you could get there faster. So we got there faster. faster. Yeah. Right. Speed. Speed so, is everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Uptake and we had very much co- uh, complementary challenges. Right. They had problems acquiring the operational data and as soon as they started talking to us they, they realized they also had problems with organizing the operational data right which are our two strengths right, right. Uh, on the other hand they've got this library of asset maintenance strategies and asset failure prediction uh, machine learning models which they need data for <laughs> which they need data <laughs> for <laughs> and, so, and they've already got these on the shelf right yeah. so we can now go end to end uh, data acquisition organization, uh, data analytics, uh, and feeding that into or using that as input to your asset strategy library, where you go, here's the maintenance strategy for this type of piece of equipment. It's actually this model, which will tell you when you need to do X. Right? So we now have a, 
and and end to end, you know, industrial asset, you know, health sustainment system uh, that no one else has. Yeah. It's all about that differentiation. Dave, uh, that sounds like a tremendous uh, transaction. I know you and the team are, are very pleased, and I'm very excited to see what happens like, as you kind of roll this out. Um, and um, uh, so what's your new role there? I see you've taken on a new, uh, new, new responsibilities. Yeah, so I'm, my title now is Chief Data Officer. All right in the, we're only a few weeks into this, so in the very short term, uh, my my brief really is integrating the Shook IoT um, technology business yep. processes yeah. yep. at, into uptake. And the, inter- the fun thing there is that um, although we were small but mighty, uh, Shook IoT as a company was was not very big. We only had 20, 25 employees, mm. but we had a lot of people with 20, 25 years experience in this domain. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, although we're a tenth the size of uptake, we're doing something that we've done before. So we're reaching into uptake now and we're finding the best of both to create something that's stronger than either was. And that's really my driving driver right now mm. is to cre- help create the best unified organization from two separate ones. Fantastic. Dave, thank you so much for coming on Digital Oil and Gas today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. We'll have to do this again in less than a year. <laughs> less than a year. We'll do it in less than a year again. Exactly right. Uh, if people want to find out more about Uptake, uh, what's the website name, Dave? Uh, uptake.com. Uptake.com. Yeah, wow. I don't know how they secured that website. <laughs> there's, there's probably a story there. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure who they had to buy it from. <laughs> well, this has been a, another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. If you like what you've heard, please press the like button or leave a comment, and uh, Dave or I will get back to you. Uh, or uh, just share this with your network so that others can find this uh, information, uh, this content, and uh, together we can help uh, improve the world. I will return in a week's time with another podcast. Bye for now.